find chapter 1. For our special guests and visitors or for some of our home folks that have been out, we want you to know that a couple of weeks ago we started a brand new series from the book of 1 Corinthians. And so we're really excited to be going through this book together. Already God has tremendously spoken and he will continue to speak. I know he will also. We've received a lot lot of feedback from our online ministry. I know many of you are probably uh, not on Facebook or not online, and that's okay. You don't have to be on Facebook or online, but I want you to know that we do broadcast these messages, first of all, live on Facebook, and then within a week, we put these up on our website, and so we're able to look on there at how many people um, watch these videos, and I want you to know it, there has been a tremendous amount of feedback in terms of uh, not only views, but also those that have piped in and said how much that it has encouraged them and spoken to them. And so we're very grateful for what, the, what God is doing. And I'm excited about this study, this study in 1 Corinthians entitled Gospel Matters. And the reason I titled it that way is because we see the Apostle Paul writing to a Corinthian church that had a lot of problems. <laughs> We've talked about that uh, the last couple of weeks, but they had a lot of problems. But problems that weren't bigger than the gospel and so Paul writes them to let them know that the gospel matters and he's going to address them and tell them how to straighten out their lives by way of the gospel and so I want us to look today at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 now again some of you might not be familiar with this but we call this expositional preaching and so we have a high view of the scripture around here. We don't gather around on a Sunday morning so we can just sing a few songs and hear a couple of anecdotes and maybe a couple of funny stories from our pastor. No, we put our ear to the text because this is where the authority in our church lies. And so we, um, every single week we come together and we open up this book and we ask God to speak to us and he's been so gracious to us to do that. And um, I'm so grateful grateful for him speaking. Now, I also want to say that we have um, uh, baptized last Sunday, and get this, I love this, uh, we've got more adult baptisms to come uh, here in the near future, and so God is working in a tremendous way, and I'm just excited, and it all comes from us putting our ear to the text and hearing what God is saying to us. And so look down there at 1 Corinthians, and um, we're going to pick it up in verse 17 Technically, uh, the passage begins in verse 18, but I want us to look at what Paul said last week to us, and we'll read down to verse 25 together, and then we'll uh, pray briefly, and we'll put our ear to the text. Here's what uh, Paul said, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, and Paul quotes here from Isaiah 29, verse 14, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Then Paul asks a series of questions here in verse 20. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? And then he declares, Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks well, they search for wisdom. But we, Paul said, preach Christ crucified. <laughs> to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Father, we ask you today to speak clearly to our hearts. I know that there's a message from your word that each and every one of us need. Father, we might have a man or a woman here that's never been saved. And so, Father, I pray that Christ is proclaimed today, that, Father, you would draw them to the very one that can save them, 
our Savior. Also know that, Father, that your church needs the washing of water by the Word. And, Father, it's through your Word that you sanctify us, you edify us. You also strengthen us. I, I wonder, Father, today if some of our members are hurting and need a word of consolation and a word of grace. And so, Father, give us everything we need today by your grace through your word. And I pray that as a preacher, Father, you'd hide me behind Jesus, hide me behind the cross today so that he may be seen and magnified and glorified. It's in Jesus' strong and mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, last week, we saw a fractured congregation, and I chose that word very wisely, and, and because, uh, mainly because Paul uses that terminology, he, uses, he used the terminology that means for a doctor to reset a bone, and he said, you Corinthians need to be set straight, and they were fragmented in many ways. You know that there were four factions, at least, that existed there in Corinth. There was a group of them saying that I'm a Paul, I'm following the Apostle Paul, he was our first pastor, and I'm following the Apostle Paul. There was a second group that claimed to follow Apollos. Apollos fo followed Paul, and Apollos no doubt was a better preacher than the Apostle Paul, but there was a group that said, we are Apollos' men and women. And then you have Peter. Uh, we have no indication that Peter ever, ever visited Corinth, but I jokingly say they must have caught Peter uh, on the web or something of that nature because they knew about Peter. And so there was a group there that said, we're going to follow Peter. And that was, those were probably Jews that were saved since Peter was a, an apostle to the Jews. And then you, you had the ultra-spiritual sect, the Jesus-only sect. They were the ones that say, were saying, uh, we only follow Jesus. And so you had these four factions within the church, and of course Paul writes to them to let them know that um, the answer for unity within the Corinthian congregation, and I might just say here he lets us know the answer for unity in our congregation is unity, first of all, around the master. We talked about that a little bit last week, but look down there in verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize. Who? Christ. And he is the one, it is Christ. He is the one that is spoken of numerous times throughout the previous passage that we're about to look at today. He is the one that unifies us. Uh, the reformers back in the 16th century had a saying. And they were the five solas, that, but one of those solas was solus Christus, Christ alone. And so they had Christ alone that unified the reformers against um, uh, many of their opponents. And so, solus Christus, Christ alone. And so that's what's going to unify us, Paul says. It's Christ. He is the one. It's the master. He is the one that is going to take our church with all of its division, and he is the one that is going to unify, unify us. But not only do we have a common master, we also have a common mission. Look down there at verse 17. He said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but what? To preach the gospel. And so we have a common mission. Christ is our common master, and our mission is to preach the gospel. And so that is what is going to unify us. We have a very eclectic group, there's no doubt about it. But one of the things that is going to unify us today is our master, but also our mission. God has called us as a church to do one thing and do one thing well. Magnify Christ by preaching the gospel. It is Jesus, it is his message, it is his, it is his name, and we have received, all of us, not just your pastor, not just your staff, not just your deacons, but we have all received the Great Commission, and so that's what's going to unify us as a church, our master and our mission. But not only do we have a common master and mission, we also have a common message. Look down there again at verse 17, he says, but to preach the gospel, watch this, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. We have a common message, the cross of Christ. And so we're not going to do that in cleverness of speech. In fact, literally, 
um, in the Hebrew, in fact, or in the Greek rather, and in your translation you might have there, not in the wisdom of men. That word cleverness there is the Greek word uh, in which we derive the word wisdom from. And so not in uh, the wisdom of men, not in cleverness of speech. And so we are going to uh, proclaim the message. And that's what's going to unify us. Not only are we um, unified by our master and his mission that he's given to us, but also in the message, the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Say, Brother Byrne, what are we proclaiming? One message, the cross. One master, one mission. And that's what's going to unify our church, even as eclectic as we are. And so today I want to talk to you from the following verses. In verse 17, that is, unity in the message. And I want you to know that the first thing that Paul says when he talks about unifying us in the message here is that the cross, that message, well, frankly, it is enough. It is enough. Look down there at verse 18. And Paul said this, For the word of the cross is foolishness. Now, that word there in the Greek, and I don't want to wear you out today in the original language, but it's the Greek word Mariah. And um, we derive our English word moron from that word. And so um, what Paul is saying here is that the word of the cross is moronic. It's foolishness. In fact, another translation is the word stupid. Uh, we are stupid. The word of the cross is stupid to those who are perishing. In other words, lost people who are, and by the way, that's present tense, lost people who are perishing think we're stupid. They think we're moronic because of the word of the cross. But, and here's the contrast, to us who are being saved, and by the way, that's present tense, that's not a mistake. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved um, from the presence of sin altogether. And so, uh, but to us who are being saved, present tense, it is the power, the dunamis, the dynamic power of God. That's what Paul says. He says it is the power of God. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the first thing that Paul says, because they were probably in Corinth divided over those who were wiser uh, than others. They were probably divided over um, those who were better in terms of their rhetoric than others. And so Paul is letting them know that when he got there, he chose to preach Christ and him crucified. And our message as a church is that Christ indeed, the cross is enough. It is the power of God. A number of years ago, in fact, um, back in the mid-19th century, lived uh, the Prince of Preachers. His name was Charles Spurgeon, a Baptist I might add, but nevertheless, uh, Charles Spurgeon was preaching, and many of you know, even as a young man, and by the way, I've been to the Metropol Metropolitan Tabernacle. I've seen the building in which uh, Spurgeon preached from, and that's changed since he preached there. There were a lot more seats there. They had a fire and a couple of wars that took place there in England and, and a little bombing that took place. But nevertheless, I've been in, in that edifice, in that building, and um, it's still a large, large church. But when uh, the Prince of Preachers would at his, was at his height, literally thousands of people would come to hear uh, the apostle, or I'm sorry, to hear the Prince of Preachers preach. And so um, uh, Spurgeon was really well known even as a young man. Well, he had an opportunity to preach to the largest crowd that he'd ever preached to, 20,000 plus at that time. And so they booked an opportunity for him to preach in the Crystal Palace. This place literally sat uh, over 20,000 people. In fact, there were over 22,000 people there that night to hear Spurgeon preach. Well, as you know, back in those days, uh, they didn't have um, sound systems like we have today. So um, Spurgeon was known for having uh, a voice that was... Um, um, a voice that was very soothing. It was, it was almost um, uh, like listening to a melody when he, would, when he would preach, but also he could project, and so people could hear him. And so anyway, when he had this opportunity to preach at the Crystal Palace there, the, um, uh, the thing that he had to do is he showed up about three days early so that he could test the acoustics in this building. He knew he could handle several thousand in his own church, but he went to the Crystal Palace to, to, for lack of a better term, to test the acoustics and to practice. 
And so he stood there in the pulpit. He had some of his men go out, take different positions uh, within uh, the palace there. And then Charles Spurgeon began to practice um, verbalizing his sermon. And so while he was doing that, uh, Spurgeon, of course, is, does like many of us when we are practicing or checking or testing a microphone, uh, he began to quote scripture. And so uh, Spurgeon, standing there in the palace with a few of his men uh, scattered throughout uh, the palace there, uh, said, John 1, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. <laughs> Unknown to him, back there in the back, probably up high, probably in a rafter of some kind, there was a janitor. And the janitor was working, and he heard Spurgeon say, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And that janitor, because he heard the word of God, fell under the conviction of the Spirit, came and gave his life to Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know, there is power in the gospel of Christ. Now you say, now Brother Byrne, that simple-minded janitor uh, needed to be saved, and he needed a simple message like the cross. Certainly an erudite, somebody that's educated, uh, somebody that uh, has more degrees than a thermometer, or somebody out there that can spout philosophy or um, economics or sociology, or somebody that's ge uh, uh, um, geared up in terms of the modern day educated system, certainly that gospel is not enough to save them. I certainly can see a janitor giving his life to the Lord, but what about the erudite? What about uh, the egghead of the world that believes in, well, he believes in science? <laughs> uh, what about a man that uh, believes in the Big Bang Theory? Uh, what about a man that believes that the earth and the universe is billions of years old and that we um, evolved out of nothing? What about a man that believes in Darwinian philosophy and um, evolution? What about a man that, is, that has read Kant and Hume and some of these other godless men like Voltaire and some of these uh, erudite men? What about men and women like that? Men and women that don't believe in the inspiration of the word of God men and women that are atheists men and women that are agnostics men and women that question epistemology whether we can even know and even more than that what about the modern day postmodern person that doesn't believe in absolute truth and therefore can explain the Bible away and can explain authority away I mean after all I can see the power of the cross saving a janitor back in Spurgeon's day but what about the modern day educated person today? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know the cross and the message of the cross is enough. Can I get one amen today? It's enough. It's enough. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have on your wall. It doesn't matter how much philosophy you can spout. At the end of the day, Paul says the cross is enough. It might be moronic. Verse 18 um, it might be foolishness, look at it there, for the word of the cross is what? Foolishness, moronic. We might look like morons as we proclaim the word of God, and it might be foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Ladies and gentlemen, the lost might think we're idiots, and they might be able to win in terms of um, a, 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 a contest, of sophistry, that is a contrast of rhetoric. They might be able to persuade and even outsmart you with their rhetoric, but at the end of the day, the gospel is the power of God. And I want you to know, we don't have to shrink back from that. I don't care if you're like me, you're a high school dropout with a GED diploma, or I don't care if you have a PhD or you're speaking to somebody with a PhD. By the way, you know how to pronounce the word PhD, don't you? My pastor used to say, now, Brother Byrne, I've got a PhD, 
PhD as well. Post hole diggers. I got them in my garage. That's what it stands for. <laughs> and, and he used to say, I'm also, I've got my PhD. I'm a preacher of hellfire and damnation. And damnation. So uh, listen, it, listen, whether you're talking to somebody that claims to be um, educated or not, I want you to know that you and I as a church, we can stand strong in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't have to shrink. We don't have to back up. We don't have to capitulate in terms of our message, ladies and gentlemen. You and I can proclaim the gospel with power. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the gospel is enough. The cross is enough. That's what Paul is saying. Now, the reason Paul is making that a point to the Corinthian church is because, well, the Corinthians were a part of the Greco-Roman first century culture. Do you remember where Paul came from? Uh, there in the book of Acts, chapter 17, before he got to Corinth, Paul had just preached a series of revival messages in the Areopagus uh, there in Athens. And so he stood in the epicenter of education. Gathered around the Apostle Paul were the Stoics. Gathered around the Apostle Paul uh, um, were the Epicureans. Both of them well-known philosophers and philosophies of the day. What did Paul preach even in Athens to the Greeks and these educated men and women? He preached Jesus. He preached the resurrection. And by the way, do you know what happened in Athens before, God, uh, before Paul uh, got to Corinth, before God brought Paul to Corinth? Acts chapter 17, verse 32 says this. I'm not asking you to turn there, but just listen how those educated men and women responded. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, see, every single Sunday and every single day was Easter Sunday for Paul because the resurrection is the power of God and it might be a stumbling block uh, to the Greeks and it might be foolishness uh, to the Jews or vice versa, but nevertheless, um, Paul's going to preach the resurrection. Now, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. It's an interesting word. They mocked Paul. They made fun of him. Um, they began to sneer. But others said, we shall hear you again concerning this matter. And so his crowd is divided. Half of them are sneering, and the other half, well, they're just procrastinating. Well, I'll give you another chance later. I mean, they're not persuaded by it. And it all had to do with Paul proclaiming the power of the resurrection to an educated audience. Now, the Bible goes on to say, but a few believed. Many believed that when Paul left Athens, that he left like a dog with his tail between his legs. Paul left defeated. And uh, by the way, I don't concur with that position. But nevertheless, many believe that Paul's attempt to um, evangelize the Athenians was a failure. Because again, the majority of his offense, uh, the majority of his congregation that was there sneered and laughed and put off what he had to say. And so Paul leaves there, and you know where he goes after he leaves Athens? He goes to start the First Baptist Church of Corinth. Now you think, now, now Brother Byrne, uh, that's like le leaving uh, the metropolis of uh, New York City or Los Angeles, California or Dallas, Texas or Houston or one of these large cities and going maybe to a little podunk town, right? I mean, after all, he leaves Athens and he goes to Corinth. no. Corinth was also a, a town located in a very, very um, um, rich place. In fact, there were a lot of travelers that came through there, but they were as much a Greco-Roman audience and town as the Athenians. And so they were just as armed. I mean, they were a county seat town. Let me put it that way. They had their local colleges there. And so they were just as armed in education and Greek philosophy as the Athenians. And so Paul shows up, and by the way, again, he didn't see a large number of conversions in Athens. He leaves perhaps with his tail between his legs, and the Bible will even say a little bit later in Corinth, Paul will even admit, when I got there, I was a little afraid. You think, now the apostle Paul, he never shook. He literally says, when I got to Corinth, I was shaking when I preached the gospel. But here's the beauty of the apostle Paul. He didn't change his message. And by the way, 
the apostle Paul was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. I mean, here was a man who was a Roman citizen. Here's a man that could speak different languages. Here's a man that um, also grew up in the Greco-Roman culture and who quoted the philosophers when he preached in Athens. That blows a lot of people away. How does the Apostle Paul know about the Stoics and the Epicureans? He was an educated man. And by the way, he was trained in rhetoric. I mean, when you think about the great rhetoricians of the past, you think of Greeks. You think of uh, great philosophers like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates or Socrates for you educated crowd. Uh, you think of men like that. Paul was trained in uh, formally writing and arguing. You say, Brother Byrne, how do you know that? Because you have people that evaluate the Apostle Paul's epistles based on rhetoric. And so you can see rhetorical devices that Paul uses all through even the book of Corinthians, things like chiasms and um, how he uses um, uh, rhetoric to persuade his audience. So, by the way, if there's anybody that could have said, hey, I'm a failure here in Athens, maybe my message of the cross, maybe my message of the gospel needs to be tweaked a little bit and changed because I'm going to the Corinth uh, city and um, if I need to... Um, identify with them a little bit better and maybe uh, make my message more palatable, it's the Apostle Paul who could have done that. I mean, Paul could have gotten up and impressed them with his rhetoric. He could have put together a speech that was, in our translation, clever, something that was witty. He could have put, put weed together, a nice argument. Um, and yet, what Paul says when he got there is that... The gospel is enough. The cross is enough. And we need to understand that. Paul did not acquiesce to his audience and say, well, I might not appear educated, uh, so in order to appear educated, let me use this, that, and the other. No, Paul just got up and said, let me preach Jesus. In fact, he said, this is all I knew when I was at Corinth, Christ Jesus and him crucified. Now think about that for just a moment. If there's anybody that could have preached anything other than Christ crucified in a fascinating way, it would have been the Apostle Paul. But here's what Paul said. I'm not a hireling. God called me to take the message of the cross and the gospel to the nations. And even though Corinth was full of erudites and educated people, Paul, and even though Paul had just left Athens, the message of the cross was enough. And ladies and gentlemen, let me make some application. As much as our culture is changing, and I truly believe the message of the gospel is even more divisive than it was 30 years ago and 40 and 50 years ago. On the heels of, um, of, of different philosophical movements that most of us have never even heard of possibly or cared about since we left college, um, but ever since days of the Industrial Revolution, ever since we had um, um, philosophical movements um, uh, that, that has swept across even the, the, the uneducated mind and even as we've moved into post-modernity and that kind of thing, at the end of the day, we have a message of the cross and more and more and more we are seen as being moronic. More and more and more we are seen as being uh, stupid with our message. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know the cross and the gospel is enough. What is going to unite us here at First Baptist Church, uh, Coeta? The thing that is going to unite us is the message of the cross. Not only do we have a master, but we also have a mission and we also have a message. And so, the message of the cross for Paul and the message of the cross for us is enough. Uh, I mentioned um, the Prince of Preachers. There was another preacher back in Spurgeon's day, middle 19th century, by the name of D.L. Moody. Now, D.L. Moody is a little bit more my speed. Uh, than, uh, than Spurgeon because Moody uh, was an, well, he was an ex-baseball player and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, he played sports, let me put it that way. Um, but uh, Moody was a, 
uh, an educated man. Spurgeon was very eloquent. And by the way, Moody was no slouch. But one of the stories I love about Moody, the last letter he wrote before he died had something like, if I remember correctly, seven or eight plus grammatical errors in it. <laughs> now, y'all might not be happy about that, but I'm happy about that, all right? And so, uh, D.L. Moody was a wonderful, wonderful preacher here in Chicago and that kind of thing. Well, he also spent a lot of time in England, and he preached there even um, during Spurgeon's time. And so he would uh, jump across the pond to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Moody gathered several hundred atheists together to challenge them on their atheistic and agnostic position. Again, this is mid-19th century. And so he had a room full of the most educated people of the, uh, of the day. Moody got up, and in his plain English, again, he's not Spurgeon-esque, but in his plain English, he simply told anecdotal stories about how he'd seen men and women on their deathbed give their lives to Christ. And Moody just preached Jesus. He just preached the gospel like he always did. You know, you'd say, now, Brother Byrne, did Moody come armed in there with uh, different uh, philosophical arguments that he might persuade the agnostic or the atheist? I mean, did he not come in there armed with a teleological argument in terms of um, persuading the, um, uh, the atheist? And the answer is No. He went in there, he preached Jesus. He shared anecdotal stories of men and women who gave their lives to Christ even on their deathbed. And at the end of the day, 500 men stood up and gave their lives to Jesus. I want you to think about that for just a moment. 500 men gave their lives to Jesus. And so Moody understood that the message of the cross was enough. And ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says here that God gives us this unpopular message as well. Look at what Paul says. He says uh, there in verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. And then Paul asks a number of rhetorical questions here. Where is the wise man? Question mark. It's a rhetorical question. Paul is saying, where's the wise man? Where is uh, the one who's educated? Where is he? Where is the scribe, the guy that was known uh, for writing in that day and the guy that was known for being educated in matters of law and things of that nature? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Where are the sophist at? Where are those that are um, known for their rhetoric? Where are those that have studied Cicero? Where are those that have studied uh, the great um, orders of the past? Where are they? And the question is, they're nowhere around. And he says here, God, has not God made, made foolish the wisdom of the world? In other words, listen. Um, our God through the gospel, our God through his message has made foolish the wisdom of the world. The world says we need a wise message. And God says what you need is the cross. And I'm going to um, show you how foolish the wisdom of the world is by the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For since in verse 21, the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. In other words, God is the one that ordained the gospel message. God is the one that is pleased not to give men and women a smart message or an educated message to save them. God is pleased to wrap salvation in a message that's simplistic, specifically the message of the cross. Verse 22, for indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. And by the way, you know that when Jesus was on the scene, they said to our Savior, if you're the Messiah, if you're the Christos, give us a Sameon, give us a sign. Do something miraculous. Show us, prove it. And so the Jews, they asked for signs. The Greeks, they were known for their wisdom. 
Sophia, the, word, the Hebrew word or the, the Greek word rather for wisdom. They were known for the wisdom and so they, they prided themselves on their educated message. And so the, the Jews, they want to sign the Greeks, they search for wisdom. But Paul said what? We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. Now I love that. Uh, he says to the Jews he said it's a stumbling block. The word there is scandalon. Um, and I, I love that word. We derive our word scandal from it. Um, but literally, when you study the word, it carried with it the idea of a trap. And it was the trigger, specifically the scandalon, was the trigger on a trap. And so when uh, the wild animal that you were trying to capture would step on it, it he would step on the scandal on, and it would set. It would bind the animal. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's using that same word. He said the preaching of the cross is to the Jews scandalous. It's a scandal on. It's a trap. And um, to the Gentiles, it's moronic. It's foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Christ is our message, Paul says. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Greek. Paul said Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul's message was Jesus alone. Now, I've been a pastor and I've dealt with a lot of, lot of issues I've been in evangelism for well over two decades. I've been literally all over the world, and I've talked with a lot of people with a lot of issues. I remember one time I was um, in Memphis, Tennessee. I was preaching the gospel in Memphis, Tennessee, and I had a man say, Pastor, and really I was an evangelist at that time, but he said, uh, Pastor, can I talk to you? And uh, so I after the service, after this evangelistic service, I went to the back. I was with the pastor of the church, plus this man that wanted to talk to me. And I stood there in the back of this church, a little, little area, uh, back in the pastor's office. And this man began to share with me some of his problems. Among his chief problem, or uh, uh, among many of his problems, was his chief problem, and that was heroin. I said, Vern, I'm addicted. He said, Pastor, that's what he called me. Pastor, I'm addicted to heroin. Now, I started running through my Rolodex. I had a master's degree at that time and was working on a master's degree. And I'd been to Oklahoma Baptist University and I'd taken Bible classes and everything else, church history, uh, preaching courses. Um, I'd taken classes in theology. But all of a sudden, I'm standing before a man that's hooked on heroin. And I started thinking, Seminary didn't prepare me for this. What do you say to a guy that says, Vern, I've got a problem. My problem is heroin. What do you say? I mean, do I all of a sudden uh, kick into Dr. Phil mode? Uh, all of a sudden start counseling this man and try to lead him to a place where he can get some help? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not smart enough to do that. I'm just smart enough to believe the Apostle Paul and believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is indeed enough. And so you want to know what I had? I had the greatest message of all. It's not steeped in philosophy, education. It's not steeped in uh, politics. It's not steeped in sociology. Ladies, it's steeped in God. And so ladies and gentlemen, I shared Jesus with that man. Now, uh, by the end of the uh, conversation, the man was laying flat down on his face, and the pastor and I had our hands on his, on his back, and we were praying um, uh, uh, as tremendously strong as I knew to pray over this man, asking God to set this man free. And by the way, by the end of the conversation, and by the end of the prayer time, I truly believed that this man repented. And I truly believe that this man was set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I can't give you um, evidence. In other words, I can't say 10 years later I met this man and saw, but I just, you just, that's all you got. But ladies and gentlemen, that is enough. And so we've got all of these people in our world, and they're saying the problem with our world is education. Oh, if we could just educate our kids, that would take care of so many of our social ills. And then the economic soothsayer comes over and says, no, move over. Our problem is not education. Our problem is economics. 
And so uh, we need to interact. We need to, and they start spouting things like, we need to make sure that we're not a socialist country and we need to make sure, and they start introducing all of these things. And, and then, oh no, then the politician comes over and says, boys, you're both wrong. Uh, it's not education and it's not um, um, uh, finances and, and economics. The problem is political. And we just need to make sure we're in the right political party and we need to make sure that we're in, 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 interacting uh, with the right world leaders and we have the right uh, governmental philosophy. And so that's, that, that's our real problem. That's going to fix our social ills. And then another man comes along and he says, no, the problem is not in education and economics and the problem is not going to be solved by our government and um, the, 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 the real problem is philosophical. I mean, uh, what we need is we need, to, we need to understand that we're postmoderners and, and uh, we need to be set free. We need a Copernican revolution in our minds. And, 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 and I mean, and the litany goes on and on and on. It seems like everybody has um, the answer. Then here comes the socialist comes along. Oh, no, the problem is the fact that these violent video games that our kids are playing. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, if we could just do away with some of these violent video games and some of this violent music, and, and, uh, and again, everybody's got a problem. Everybody's got an answer. By the way, I heard about a guy that was talking to a friend. He said, um, he said uh, I believe the two biggest problems that we face in America today um, is ignorance and not caring. He said, what do you think about that? And uh, the guy said, well, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> and I'm, everybody's got an answer, okay? Everybody's got an answer. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what Paul is telling the church. We've got the answer. Pastor, do you really believe that? Yes, we've got the answer. I remember when I was a high school dropout, I was in trouble with the authorities. I was living an immoral life. I remember when my father, uh, who was an alcoholic, and my sister who died because of drugs and alcohol, I remember when I was in that environment. You want to know what changed, Brother Byrne? You want to know why I'm so-called a, a good moral citizen that pays my taxes today and can hold down a job and loves baseball and apple pie? You want to know why I'm like I am today? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's that message. And I'm telling you that that message is what we need to unify around in our church. We're going to have a lot of differences in politics. As I said last week, we're going to have a lot of uh, differences in other arenas, education and other arenas. But at the end of the day, we will unify around the gospel. Why? Paul said the cross and the gospel is enough. We've got one master. We've got one mission. And we've got one message. Let's unify around it. Stand with me all over the auditorium.